And I'm just about to be joined by one of well, cycling's favourite innovators, and here he is already, Adam Hansen. Uh, without uh, any more of an intro, I'm just going to chuck him into the stream and we'll see what we end up with, but I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating interview, so let's go. Good morning. Good morning, you're up and early. I know, I know. What time is it over there and where are you? Tell me more about yourself. What's going on, Adam it Hansen? 8 past 6 p.m. Um, I'm in the Czech Republic. Okay. What else do you want? You've got a National Champions jersey in the background. What else can we see hanging in the in the distance? My first um, Grand Tour jersey. Oh, I don't know if you can see the T-Mobile one there. Next to the poster. Room. So that is a T-Mobile jersey in 2000 and. Seven or at the Velta. Oh, okay. My and first um, Grand Tour that I finished. The first that you finished. And you've done a few since. So how's life, mate? You're feeling like you're absent from something that you're a big part of for a long time, that being the pro peloton? I feel free. <laughs> okay, free, ready to think again, rather than just get on the bike like an automaton day after day. Race after race. I'm still training a bit, but it's good. Actually, I was watching, I don't watch cycling much, but I was watching one race and it was cold and it was raining. I was like, <laughs> I'm so happy not to be there. <laughs> I could just feel the riders, you know, they're just like shaking on the bike and that. I was like, oh, oh, guys. <clears throat> yeah. Do you think that there's a real sense of relief in the peloton that there is some racing going on in 2021? Um. You know, I kind of think the uh, the cyclists don't really, they're not really aware how bad the situation is because it seems like somehow the world has stopped, <laughs> all other events are cancelled, but somehow these cycling races continue. It's crazy. Yeah, it does feel a bit um, fictitious at times, doesn't it? Like you get press which release. Is good, which is good. But I'm just like, um, <clears throat> like I'm trying to do Ironmans this year and I can just see races are cancelled, postponed and things like that and... Um, which is, you know, it's okay in that. Well, I'd better race. But then I just see all these cycling races continue going and I thought, okay, then, yeah, they're actually really lucky. Yeah, it is. It is like that. Do you hear from any of your former colleagues? Um, yeah, I do, actually. Um, and also competitors, too. <laughs> yeah. There you are. And uh, we're, we're going to – you've been keeping busy, so we're going to talk a little bit about what came up on uh, cycling news yesterday. Um, if that's all right with you. For sure. Yeah. So um, where do we begin? Because a lot of it was covered by the report, but um, it looks like um, the mind of Adam Hansen never stops whirring. So <laughs> when did this project begin? And uh, do you see it uh, concluding before October? Is that sort of debut date or, um, or will it um, never? Yeah, well, uh, you know, well, I, I'm going into Ironmans and... I've always been fascinated with some of the Ironman bikes. I used to have the uh, 2001 uh, Zip Frame. I don't know if you remember that Boomerang style. Yeah, like super old bike. And I love, I love how an Ironman's where you don't have, you're not bound by the UCI rules, so you can really do not whatever you want, but you know, you can sort of, um, yes, get away from the traditional um, double triangle frame. So I've always wanted to build a bike, and it just gave me the opportunity. And when I was looking at sponsorship for um, frames and that. Um, I just thought, okay, I can have this or I can build something. And <clears throat> I'm in a very fortunate position at the moment where I don't have to uh, sign sponsors if I don't really want them. Um, I'm not, like, begging for, you know, um, product or begging for cash or anything like that. So I get to choose my sponsors. And <clears throat> some of the, the offers I had, um, I didn't really want to be locked into something also. So... Uh, with the bike, it was sort of like, okay, I can have this, this. And I had some pretty good um, deals, but I wasn't so happy with the equipment. And um, I just thought, oh, you know, it'd be nice to build my own bike. And um, I, I love having the pressure to be put on <laughs> to be put on myself. <clears throat> so I thought, okay, I'll just do it this year. I was meant to ride one year on a sponsored bike, um, but then I thought, no, no, I'd just do it straight away. Because I have a, I have a Ridley Dean, and I have no reason to, you know, um, go out and get a frame and, 
um, something from a manufacturer because I have the Ridley and I can do what I want. And, um, yeah, and I thought I could just, when my bike is uh, complete, I'll just switch from the Ridley to my own bike. Okay, but so uh, from from all accounts, it's going to be entirely different to anything we've seen before. I mean, um, concept bikes aren't anything new. We've seen them for donkey's years, really. And um, there's a couple of bits and pieces on the, the illustration that I saw that seem to hark back to to sort of fantasy designs of the past. It is a real sort of Batman style bike, isn't it? And what, what are you going to call it? And, um, and and is it going to be a production thing or is it just going to be your personal thing? No, I actually like to um, put in production. One thing is I, I, um, I've always believed um, the biggest problem with a lot of bikes today is that, uh, you know, people talk about, um, you know, tyre pressure, tyre width and things like that, where what I found when I was looking at some of the TT bikes in the past, when you sit on the bike, you don't have very good 50-50% um, ratio of uh, weight distribution. And this plays a huge um, factor into rolling resistance. And I remember talking to one of the sponsored brand I had. Um, they said, oh, what can we do to improve the bike? I was like, God, you've got to change your rake angle, your fork, so we have better um, weight distribution. And just the bike will be faster because of that. Um, and, you know, they were like, ah, oh, but we're talking about more aerodynamics and things like that. I said, yeah, yeah, but, you know, okay, for sure you can make more aero, but just by changing your, your weight distribution can have such a huge factor. And when I look at TT bikes, they also don't have the best weight distribution. So with this bike, what I'm doing is I'm having a really long wheelbase, and this makes it easier to have a good weight distribution. And because of this... Um, super long wheelbase, it's sort of catered for everyone in a sense. So a lot of bikes is when you go for a smaller size, actually the wheelbase gets shorter too. But I want to stay away from this because what happens normally is um, on a traditional bike, your bottom bracket to your rear wheel is always fixed on all bikes. And basically, as they get bigger, the, the front um, end sort of just goes out. But the seating position stays the same. So your weight is in the same place. They just extend along with your arm reach where – what should happen is you should actually, when when the wheelbase goes through that, the, the rider should be more in the, in the centre. Yes, you should also, um, you know, build in the sense so that the person has good reach on the bike, but it's not, the, the weight shift is not playing a factor. So I've sort of done the, the sizing of this bike where it's super long wheelbase, which is not the best for like um, handling because it's 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 um, going to be a very stable bike. Um, and by stable, I mean is when something's stable, that it really flows in the direction. Where something is twitchy, you, you, it's easier to move. So this is going to be a very stable bike. It's going to have a very long wheelbase. It's going to be very comfortable. And it's, you know, it's, it's a triathlon bike, so it's got to be comfortable. It's got to be easier to ride. It's just got to go straight. Um, and, but because of this and having such a long wheelbase, then you can have a lot of different riders fit on it. And because I'm going to have the integrated seat poles, so I'll make it super long. And riders can just cut it short. And you can't actually see it in the, in the graphics, but how I'm doing the handlebar setup is – the, the, the fork has a very big nose on it and it's just going to have holes through it and then you insert your handlebars through that. So you can actually take it out and you can actually move it in um, closer to you or further away from you. So that's also the stem integrator. So um, it's going to be difficult for some really, really small bikes. So let's say it's an XS or some really small uh, riders. But I hope that it'll be able to cater to around um, – 51 centimetres all the way up to, you know, 60 to 62 centimetres this frame. So I do hope to, yeah, go into production. Okay. Well, it sounds, it sounds fascinating. Um, the, the, the actual manufacture will be done in your house in Czech Republic or what's going on? Like, uh, could, I don't know where do we go because we could talk about carbon fibre layup or we could talk about crosswinds in Kona, but um, because, <laughs> you know, aerodynamics isn't only just bang front on, is it? It's a whole lot oh, of things. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, which, so which topic we take, I can go on many tangents. Well, I know, I know it sounds funny that it's just in my house, um, but my my workshop is 160 square meters, so you know it's it's a big workshop I have. Um, I've been doing shoes for actually, I know how long I've been doing shoes. Maybe um, yeah, uh, seven years, I think. Seven years I've been working with composites and shoes. Are, shoes, are, I know it's a smaller item, but it's a lot more complicated. Um, than people think because with shoes the thing the problem with shoes is the inside of the shoe has to be perfect 
because your foot goes in there. For a carbon uh, frame, uh, carbon bike, for example, the outside is nice for um, visual, but in the inside you have all the, the tear-off material and the vacuum bag and things like that. So you just got to um, consider the outside. Where on, on a cycling shoe, the inside's got to be perfect and the outside's got to be good visual. So this is a lot more difficult in that sense. And plus it's this, the shoes are a lot thinner and there's – totally different layup on the shoes with the bottom and the top has to be flexible material where on a bicycle um, you don't have to play around with the epoxy type epoxy you use as, as i did in the shoes um, so you know the bike in some sense is a easier on a composite wise it's a bit more let's say confusing because or more difficult with the internal cabling and that um, but i'm going to i'm going to do it how i know composites and do what's best with what I know in the tools I have. Um, so I have all the tools for it. I have uh, everything for um, composites. So that's that's easy. And with um, producing the mold, I'm just going to like the luxury we have with 3D printers now. Um, I'll be actually printing the bike, the, the, the plug, um, and then I'll be making the mold from that, which will be done with composites, um, mostly fiberglass. And then from the molds, I'll make the other carbon frame. So yeah, I have everything here. Oh, cool. Okay. And what do you anticipate it weighing? You know, more or less what you're coming up towards, even no, if you're production. Yeah, product. with 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 weight, um, this is weight is not important for triathlons. That's the first thing, and I and I want to keep this um, <clears throat> bit out of it because because the bike is so narrow. Uh, your traditional um, bike frame is hollow in the centre, and they don't use sandwich material. Many many years ago, the very first frames, I think um, it was time they use uh, a foam in the centre um, as a honeycomb material, like a sandwich material. Sorry, I should say sandwich material. <clears throat> where as the the tubes get wider. Um, and the shapes of them, then you didn't need the, the sandwich material. But because this is so narrow, I'm going to use this, the sandwich layup. So I'm going to use carbon, sandwich, another uh, carbon, sandwich, another carbon. Um, so that's going to be like um, six different layups. No, I don't mean like six layers, but like one layup, let it cure, sandwich, let it cure, another carbon, let it cure, sandwich. So it's going to, the, the building process is going to be super long. Um, and because of this, this is how I can will be able to achieve stiffness with such a narrow frame. And but because of this, it's going to add extra weight. And for me, it's not about making it light; it's about making it super narrow and also stiff. Also, the front fork is horizontal. Um, this is really impractical. <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is really minimise the frontal area uh, to make it more aerodynamic. And also. Um, when the wind um, hits the fork, so that's the widest part of the bike, um, it's going to create the, the channel and just stay there. So that's where your feet are moving and that's where the rear fork also. So from the top end, it's going to be super clean and the fork is going to be really reinforced um, because of horizontal forks. So this is this is not going to be light. Um, when I did the calculations, the, the, the amount of layers I'd have to do in the fork is going to be, the fork's going to be heavier than the whole frame. That's, uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure about that. But it's got to be safe. Yeah, it has to be safe. Yeah, imagine just uh, taking the lead in the in the bike leg, and then all of a sudden at the turnaround, it all collapses, and you're on the floor looking like a goose. That'd be terrible. For sure, my name's on it, so I got to make sure it's um, <laughs> make sure it's work, <laughs> working. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's just um, I don't even know where to start. But you talked about you know just the, the freedom that triathlon offers, and I've had some great interviews with triathletes over the years, including Cam Worth, who I don't know what he is. He's he's everything, man, isn't he? But um, uh, and Craig Alexander and a couple of guys who have won those the, the Ironman over the years, and I've wondered why, um, given let's say, the UCI's resistance to certain things like the Superman position developed or, you know, pioneered by Graham O'Brien. Bree. Um, and when you look at, you know, pursuing history and you realise, you know, when Chris Boardman, for example, in, uh, I could forget the year when he rode his 411 in, in Manchester, probably it was 1996. Anyway, it's a bit of uh, cycling history that I'm sort of trying to hark back to. But the point being, there's aerodynamics at play that you're allowed to do, as well as just manipulating the bike. Are you going to go for an extreme position or are you going to more or less hold what you've been racing as a cyclist? 
Um, no, I'm going to uh, also like with in cycling, we're also limited, restricted to um, our error bars angle. So this can be um, changed quite a lot. You know, it's really interesting going from cycling to triathlons because, you know, there's rules in cycling and uh, under the UCI and we know the rules and we know why they have the rules. There's a very, very good reason why they have the rules. And always watching triathletes, I'm always like, I'm just seeing something a lot like, why, why don't they go past the rules? Because, you know, the UCI enforces, you know, the, how, how high you can have your forks because it can be a huge aerodynamic um, benefit. Um, you know, having the five the, the, the seat five minute millimetres, uh, five centimetres behind the bottom brackets, you know, it's a huge advantage if you go more forwards also. And triathletes don't really adopt this. A lot of them, they go close to it. Some are starting to do it, but I can really see that um, they're just doing, you see guys still with straight bars, just catching wind, you know, at the front. Um and you know it's a bit of a shame, but that that's what they're doing. And I, I and what I like to do is um, have the same roll position that I have because I do have very forward seat also. Um, I'm still going to use long cranks, and yeah, I'll have a, I'll really change my position, be more up because it's more important to be narrow than down. And also, you can be narrow if your body can take the position and still put out good power if it's higher where if you're going sort of lower then you do compromise on your power quite a lot so i will go for a lot higher position and my arms will just be catered where my body is instead of just going down and trying to reach to my arms i go as low as i can go with my body and then put my arms directly in front and that's that's sort of your optimal position for your power transfer you really just want to, that chest catchment is just the real plague for cycling isn't it and you're trying to exactly. negate yeah. I wonder, just given your upbringing um, in Cairns, you know, you would have done snorkeling or uh, uh, lots of swimming over the years. I talked to um, uh, to Alex Dowsett about this, you know, just the idea of uh, getting your aerodynamic cues from aquadynamics, which is more or less the same thing. Do you find yourself swimming and putting yourself in a certain position and wondering, oh, how would that go on a bike? It's an obtuse question, but, uh, you know, you're an obtuse bloke, you might respond <laughs> well actually you know when you say like aerodynamics um you know, like like in swimming and that when i was um uh, i did quite a bit of swimming um uh not last year before a little bit for um, a lot more than normal i should say and i was really trying to be really um slipstream in the, in the water uh and uh victor kampanats is a he used to be an ex-triathlete and he's a super good swimmer he's a very good swimmer and he was looking like um swim stroke in um uh, Gonji, the two of Gonji, we were, we were rooming in the same hotel together. We went up to the pool and he'd watch me swim and I was doing some training after the stages and he was coming in with me and he was looking at my swim stroke and he goes, wow, you're so aerodynamic. I said, well, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, because also in the swim, you want to be as slipstream as possible um, because it's like you said, you know, it's the, it's the same, um, it's the same effect in the waters. And yeah, I haven't thought about it from, um, from a swimming point of view onto the, onto the road bike. That's a good point you made. But what I did do is I, I reached out to a, um, uh, I looked at um, aerodynamics, uh, like a, a guru in aerodynamics, and he used to be on the Mercedes F1 team, um, worked with aerodynamics there. And I wanted to speak to someone before I designed the bike. If I wanted to speak to someone outside of cycling because what I found was is um, <clears throat> we're all in this bubble and we're all you know trying to do our maximum to improve things. And we all see things in the cycling and go, okay, they do that. How can we improve that? And, and we're sort of just following one point and just trying to improve that point where I spoke to this one aerodynamic guru and he knew nothing about cycling. And I was like, why do they do this? You know, um, will the uh, horizontal forks be more beneficial than um, the forks dropping down? And then also like, um, you yeah, asked him all these things and, and I, and I was showing him um, like, uh, you have like these vectors where wind would catch onto something and you would try and grab the wind to bring it around you more, or you try and reflect the wind off and just, like you've probably seen TT suits and they have different fabric on the on the shoulders, right? And that's meant to be more aerodynamic. He looked at you and said, this doesn't make sense because here you want that fabric. But down here in the biceps, you don't want it. Because where your biceps are, there's no body underneath it. So in this section here, you don't want to have those trips there. Up here, yes, because that's because this follows this follows your body, and that's where you want to trip the end and bring it around here. He said, Why do they do that? I said, Well, actually, they found out that having the trips here is faster than not having the trips at all. But he goes, yeah, but I bet they didn't test having the trips only in the shoulder and not the biceps. And the point is that someone outside the bubble looks directly and goes, yeah, but, you know, this is, why did they do this and that? And you can see in the cycling industry, it's like, okay, we had nothing there. 
trips down the whole arm is faster than not having trips. And then this guy's like, yeah, yeah, but they should have just done the shoulders <clears throat> and not the biceps. And then while I was speaking to um, a guy I should not, I cannot mention here, <laughs> and he was saying that, yeah, we never tested it, but it makes sense. Um, it's from the UK and I'll be working with him in the future, but it's not um, uh, official yet. Uh, and then he was like, yeah, we never thought of that. We should test that. And it makes sense. And it's just things like this where I really want to step outside of cycling, talk to some experts, and sort of bring in new ideas and fresh ideas into cycling. I like that thinking. Um, I have a little anecdote, and I'll run it by you. So I was at the wind tunnel in Monash University probably end of 2017 with Luke Durbridge and Michael Hepburn and Caleb Ewan and a bunch of guys from Green Edge. And we were, they were manipulating their position to try and get different gains. And they kept, as you do, you know, kept bringing your arms up, bringing your arms up, different things like that. They were playing with booty covers and realising different things. And I put it to the guy who was doing the data, when are we going to start considering blood flow? For example, if you're going to keep doing this and you're bending your elbow and you're restricting that movement and the whole idea of, of what we've learned from over the years in cycling is that uh, good blood is is really amazing for your performance. And if you're basically putting, you know, kinks in the hose in various parts of your body, um, it is limiting the blood flow. So is there ever a way where you're going to sort of start considering your body position so that you allow... Um, that's just trying to sort of give you another idea for outside the box. And, um, right, it definitely makes like sense. It actually definitely makes sense. Um, I was talking to a few um, people in the shoe industries when I was doing my shoes um, because all the shoes you have, um, you have narrow tail box, uh, toe box in the toes and then you also have um, raised toe box too. And when I was uh, talking to um, some biomechanics about this, they were like, yeah, but it also if you have a, um, a too aggressive toe rate raised toolbox then you're restricting all the blood flow in your foot and in certain areas and this can um this is why a lot of riders have terrible pains like here and that because you're really restricting the blood flow and if you have a flat foot then you have a lot more blood flow and if you have a uh, not a narrow toe box and have a bit more wider one then you have even more blood flow um and i was doing exactly what you're saying um with re regarding blood flow with my shoots um because they were saying that the problem with cycling shoes is there's too much tradition with Italian footwear where it looks more elegant and more stylish to have a super narrow toe box. And a wide one is um, yeah, not so attractive, like my shoes, for example. I have a very wide toe box to increase the blood flow. Because for me, um, the amount of riding I did, the amount of racing I did, uh, yeah, you want to have comfy shoes, that's for sure. Okay. I mean, uh, that's just a pet topic of mine. I went and saw a shiatsu person years ago and, and unfortunately she's passed on, but she did a lot of work with a wooden spoon around my fingernails and um, and around my toenails, exactly what you're talking about with getting making sure that the blood continues. So I don't want to sort of move from aerodynamics into something that I don't really understand. But um, <laughs> talk to me a little bit about how you think that this... Um, this behemoth is going to cope with crosswinds and the like. Can you um, explain that? I mean, when it's windy at Kona, it's pretty hellacious. I, and uh, is it going to sort of push you over from the side, even if you're efficient with the wind coming at you from the front? Um, you know, it's it's really it's really hard to test these things um, before you build them. Um, and for me, it was more okay. There's more than just one race in the calendar, and the, the other thing I'm doing, especially with this bike, is at the moment it'll be running more narrow hubs than um, standard. And how I'm doing to achieve this, uh, for example, is that um, – can you give me two seconds? How about a sample? Yeah. I don't know if I can show you this very clearly. So this is just uh, something I 3D printed to test. and. You can see here that the hubs are actually rested inside the, um, the, the, the fork. And this is uh, the first part I, I just 3D printed. And a normal hub is this wide, where I actually have the whole fork inside. And the only way I can achieve this if I don't have the spokes coming out. Um, so because of that, 
um, this bike is going to be super skinny, super skinny in the front. So not only the whole frame is 28 millimeters, even the front forks are super narrow. So, and I can only achieve this with um, a three spoke wheel, a two spoke wheel, um, like fast forward has a two spoke wheel and a disc in the back. So when you look at a disc at the back wheel, you have, you have the, the pedal axis and the disc is just here, but you still have the, the rear triangle. Um, and what I'm doing is if there's if there's no spokes, cut it. And the fork will come directly back and hold onto the um uh the, the, the hub on the on the axle on the hub. So it's a straight line. And also, so and because of this, I can't have because of the pitch angle of the spokes, I can't have a spoked wheel in this in this frame. Um and I, I knew this at the start, and I knew Kona that you cannot have a disc wheel and you cannot have um, three spokes wheels and that and this bike would not be allowed to be used in corner uh, and for me it's more like well you know there's no guarantees I'm going to corner this year and uh, I have to qualify for corner because uh, I will be racing the pro category so it's not going to be easy for me at all it's not going to be a walk in the park uh, and for me it's just okay build the fastest bike and then I'll see after that about building a spoke version. And to build a spoke wheel version, then, okay, I've got to change the forks in the front and the rear. Um, I have looked into um, creating my own hubs and using uh, – because I can play around – because with <coughs> – which pitch angle with the forks <coughs> – sorry, pitch angle of the spokes, so the wider, the more stiffer. So if you go too narrow, then the pitch angle is really short then you're going to have uh, – sorry, really low. Then you're going to have a lot of flex in the front wheel. So – I, I can what I can do is cheat a little and I can have the flanges super long and by increasing the super long makes the distance from the, the rim to the, the, the flange much shorter and that increases the pitch angle of the spokes. So this can create stiffness also because I you know the bike has to be stiff the, the wheels have to be stiff also. So for me, make it a three spoke wheel or disc in the back because most of the races I'll be doing with will be in those conditions with those wheels. And then corner happens. Um, yeah, I, I make a different bike for that. And that'll um, have the same frame. I, I don't believe, I don't really don't believe the frame is going to be so bad with the spoke wheel and crosswinds. Also, having said that, I have spoken to some cyclists that did do corner and they said, okay, it's not so windy, but it's more really windy for triathletes. And they have this rule because a lot of athletes go there and they're not, I don't want to sound arrogant or anything, but they're not the best cyclists in the world. So they, they do have trouble in the crosswind. So because of this, they've just capped it, you know? Um, but yeah, I will have a spoked wheel version and I, I don't think I'm not, look, I could be hundred percent wrong. I don't think it's going to be so bad this frame. Okay, cool. Uh, we, you said half hour on 28 minutes, so I'm just going to quickly rip into the concept of the derailleur. Uh, you'd want to go electronic shifting, and you're going to have the front derailleur moving as the chain moves down the cassette. Is that how it works? Yeah, so basically you have a straight chain line, and it'll just – so when you change the rear, the front will change with it, and okay. they'll just follow each other. Um, and I, I haven't finalised this yet. I've just got the, the working derailleur. Um, and the front part, um, the front um, chain ring, I'm still working on. And the benefit of having this is I can go less sprockets at the back. So in your traditional um, bike, you have, let's just say 53, uh, 39, there's, and you have, um, uh, let's say, a 10 speed, just an example, there's huge crossover. There's so many gears that are doubling up. Um, they're not the exact same roll shift, but there's a huge crossover where what I can do is, and the reason why you have this is because they can't go too extreme because then you have, because you can't utilize every gear because then you have too much cross. So you can't use like a 53, 27, for example, too much cross or 39, 11, too much chain cross. So that's why they um, have this uh, crossover. Where if I don't have a crossover, then I can utilize every single gear. So then it makes no sense for me to have like a 39, uh, 53 and a 25 or 27, 11 because I've done my own gear. So what I can do is really change the, the front um, chain rings to be um, to be very different in size. And then at the back, I can have a one cog jump from every single sprocket. So then I'll actually have more usable gears than the traditional setup, and I can even have six speed at the back or even seven speed at the back and have more usable gears at a closer ratio with zero chain cross on the same setup. 
Um, and this makes it much more easier because I have less gears at the back. I have um, less, the front uh, chain ring doesn't have to move so much over. And um, this is where sort of the idea comes from. Um, so I have more usable gears always with a straight chain line. And um, so, yeah, so at the moment, it's still undeciding if it's going to be six speed or seven speed at the back, which would make it, you know, uh, 12 to 14 usable gears with a straight chain line. That's a great explanation. And we've hit Does that make sense? It, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And I think that, um, you know, you think that the, the bicycle has reached its zenith and then there's always some way around, you know, how to improve it. So you, you, you're coming at it, even if, let's say it all falls over and none of it works, who cares? At least you've thought about it. I think that's a great experiment. <laughs> so, hey, thanks very much for taking the time to explain all of that. I look forward to catching up again because it's always fascinating chatting with you. And um, Very good. Uh, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, signing off, eh? Yep, thank you. Have a good one. Have Cheers, a good day. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.